Hello. I'm Kim Doherty, one of your iSchool career specialists, and I'd like to welcome you to this career webcast with Mindy Beatty. Mindy Beatty leads the Library and Information Services Group at pharmaceutical company Gilead Sciences, Inc. in Foster City, California, and that's a job she's held for the past three years. The LAS group supports Gilead's users globally with research services and access to databases and journals to enable all of the Gilead colleagues to make informed decisions. Before joining Gilead, she managed teams at two other pharmaceutical companies and a chemical company. Mindy holds an MSLS from Catholic University, and in her free time, Mindy enjoys tasting wine, baking, and exploring California, which sounds like a terrific combination to me. In today's webcast, Mindy's going to share information about LIS careers in the pharmaceutical industry, her own career path, and her career advice based on her own experiences. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Mindy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kim, and I appreciate you and Kelly helping to facilitate this, and um, I'm excited about presenting out to San Jose students. So I'll jump right in and um, start with the second slide. So in the, first I'll introduce um, a little bit more about uh, the current functions. Talk about organization design, like where do information functions fit in pharmaceutical companies? Um, what kinds of roles and responsibilities are there for people? What kinds of um, tasks are involved with those jobs? Um, what are desired skills that many companies look for? And because some people may think, it's mostly that you have to have a biology degree or something, but it's very interesting because a lot of times soft skills are, can be more important in a role um, and moving you forward than necessarily the hard skills. And then also talk about how to own your career because you have to drive it, and I will talk a lot about that. <laughs> I'll get started. So as uh, Kim mentioned, my experience is a, uh, has been for 20 years at chemical and pharmaceutical companies. And I actually started out more on the information scientist side after I was um, graduated from library school. I actually had managed um, a firm in Washington, D.C., where I got to start a library from scratch. So that was pretty cool. It was a government contract firm. and. Then I was hired at Dow Chemical and moved to Michigan to manage their corporate information center. And I did a lot of work for, you know, business development, strategic planning, things like that. Um, I don't have a STEM degree. I started out more on the business corporate side. And I have worked with companies and it, with a team of people in all backgrounds, uh, similar to what I've listed here in my current organization. At Gilead, we have six total team members, including me. I have four information scientists, some with pharmacy, some with library science, biology, chemistry. My most recent hire was somebody that came last year, and she was hired from the lab in, inside of Gilead already. And then me as the content manager. So in many pharmaceutical companies, um, the they library or information management function fits usually in three different areas. Many times it's in medical affairs, and I'll explain what that is, or research and development, or IT. Um, I've worked in companies where I've been in medical affairs and I've been in IT. I've not worked in an organization except when I was at Dow many years ago and when I moved over to the scientific R&D library where I was actually under the R&D function. But in, in the organization that I'm involved in called the Pharma Documentation Ring, which is a professional association of 20, I think there's 25 member pharmaceutical companies. Um, those are the three functions that most companies are under. So most people know what research and development is. Um, and the IT organization, of course, is information technology. Medical Affairs is the organization that um, a lot of times is doing uh, our pharmacists who are working in medical information or they're developing standard content that would be shown to a healthcare practitioner, such as a doctor. 
Um, and so they are actually 36% of our overall number of requests, the people who are in medical affairs. And we also have the Health Economics and Outcomes Research Group in medical affairs. It's quite a large group. There's like over 500 people globally in medical affairs. Our company overall has over 9,000 employees now. Um, and so we still have our team of six. <laughs> But we've done a lot of strategic planning and um, outreach in the past year and really grown our business, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions about that as well. So there are, of course, related functions to the information management function, and in many pharma companies, these can be separate. Like I know at our company, the competitive intelligence function is separate. Patent searching usually falls under the legal department. And there can be records management, knowledge management, or enterprise content management, which is management of internal assets, not external content like the library group manages. So some companies, these fall, the information management function comprises a few of these or maybe all of these functions, but I did want to list them because there's many different roles that won't, are, will be in these functions, not necessarily just the ones that I'm list talking about tonight during this presentation. The funding models um, is very different as well. And so the funding models in a, in a pharmaceutical company is that the budget can be centralized, as in it's managed under the library kind of function, and everything is the databases, the journals are all licensed and managed and funded centrally by that function. Decentralized means perhaps your group still manages it, but you are managing it on behalf of other groups and they might be paying for it. There's also what's called a chargeback or cross-charging environment, um, and some pharma companies do um, have this kind of uh, organizational structure as well. So in a chargeback environment, what that means is that most you can charge, like charge that department for specific services. You might charge them for research services and you have to keep track of what you're doing, or at least some databases or especially article delivery, like what's called document delivery, most of the time that's charged back. Like if people order articles, it, get, it gets charged to their particular cost center or department. Um, we are not in a chargeback environment, but we do manage kind of centrally and decentrally with um, budgets because we manage many of the resources in the company but not all, and we work with other departments and sometimes we share costs or they're paying for resources that we also put on our e-library because they're enterprise accessible. So there's many different um, funding models in companies. So. We did have a poll. <laughs> Are you already working in an information center or a library? And you could say yes or no through the polling if you'd like to answer that question. I see we have a check and a no. Of course, I am. Thank you for responding. So I think that helps, you know, set the stage for where we go with the rest of the presentation. So in pharmaceutical companies and in many companies, because um, I'm also involved in another organization that is some pharma but other corporations like oil and gas companies, um, aerospace, big companies like 3M, Dow, Chemical, Cargill, et cetera, um, there are almost always roles for information scientists and like the content manager, which I'll talk about. So I've listed alternative titles here, information scientist or information specialist, and I also listed data scientists because in some companies, they have completely changed the roles of their information scientists over to data scientists, so they're doing different type of work. But basically, a lot of it is, sometimes people say, well, I'm a searcher. I prefer a different title than <laughs> a searcher, but what it means is that they're doing advanced literature searching across many different areas, because like for us, it could be in the medical literature, or it could be finding market research, research they're doing for business development or corporate development. You might be using commercial um, databases that have forecasting information or competitive intelligence databases, but you can also be doing the medical and scientific like biology side of it. Um, but a lot of that is about not just being reactive and doing the quick searches, 
but moving toward that advanced technical search kind of um, comp uh, competency where you're not just identifying, but you're analyzing and synthesizing the information and also delivering the literature perhaps in a different way, like, you know, using text mining tools, doing more visualization, um, making it more useful. And so a lot of times when people ask you to do a request for them, what they may want is something they can put into a PowerPoint slide that goes up to their manager and then up further through the company. So many of the people on who are information scientists are getting more into these advanced tools and to do more visualization, do more analysis rather than just here's a literature search of the biomedical literature and you return back a list of references and citations. The other thing that's different is in moving from that sort of reactive role to the proactive role is partnering with project teams. So what that means is instead of you being kind of invited in at the beginning of a project and then they don't, when they don't need anything, they don't come back to you until later when they have another request, is you actually become a core team member of the project. And that's actually where we've moved in the past 18 months after the, we've rolled out our strategic plan. So the best part about that, of course, is that your team members are much more embedded in the project teams and they have the knowledge that all of the team members have from the very beginning and see how their remit changes or they say, oh, well, what about this? We haven't talked about this. And so the, the information scientist is in the room, they're on the calls, and they can understand the context and the direction of, a, of the research team, so they can be a much more effective information professional in the types of uh, research that they're providing. So as I mentioned, um, also there are other activities that they do, of course, identifying, evaluating, acquiring, and deploying tools and resources. So if we're looking at another clinical trial database, they're going to compare those tools, do a matrix of what's, you know, one has versus the other, you know, why would we buy this one versus the other one, how much information did they find, where were the gaps. Um, they may also, of course, do work on the deployment, so work with the vendor to do the training, communicate out to the users, target those specific groups of people, or publish stories on the intranet about particular training or offerings. And then there's other, you know, sort of library operations things that they may get involved in. So these are the other duties as a sign that are in the job description. Content procurement, of course, is a key role, and you find that in most pharma companies, this is a role that is usually not done by the procurement department. In some companies, that group is called strategic sourcing. Um, content licensing and the pricing on that and the license terms is very different than the people who do an RFP to select a new Xerox repair system or a new drug safety system or something like that. Um, so a lot of times they're more than happy to have our group still be the subject matter experts. We do partner with procurement when we need to, like if you actually are, do need to do a request for a proposal um, for a particular service, because let's say there are multiple companies who provide that service, then they'll help you run that request for proposal. But also procurement departments and a lot of companies are not going to get involved unless there's quite a lot of money, you know, where they can offer their expertise. But that way they can help with, their, like I said, request for proposal process, help you with the, the weighting, as in W-E-I-G-H-T, of those specific requirements you have, and help you make a decision uh, based on all the requirements of the people involved in it. But in general, what the person who's doing content procurement is doing is managing the negotiations and the renewals for all the resources and services. And in many companies I've worked in, I've managed budgets from, you know, when I was much more junior, you know, let's say I started out with a couple of licenses that were only $50,000 and then moved into companies where I was managing 10, 20, 30 million dollar budgets. Um, so it depends on the size of the company, how many resources they have and how much budget you have. Um, and also managing the budget is a big part of this job as well, which I have at the bottom of the slide. So managing copyright compliance procedures and systems is very important. Um, most companies in pharma have a copyright clearance center license um, and you have to be able to provide 
you know, copyright compliant materials. There's also a, an interesting thing in pharma that's very different. Um, we have specific license terms for um, being able to provide content for a submission to a regulatory body. So for example, when your company is putting in a submission to the FDA of a new drug, you know, a lot of the literature that goes along with that submission um, can be put in the submission without having to pay an external copyright fee if it's from your licensed journals. Um, that's uh, a key term. Um, and then there's also the medical information, what's called reactive use. So these are, again, are clauses that you need to have in your licenses. And they're actually now covered under the CCC's annual license, but a lot of companies still have them individually. So what reactive use is, is if you are a pharmacist working in a medical information department, you get calls or requests from pharmacists, nurses, physicians, et cetera, what are called healthcare practitioners. In order to answer a question, many times the pharmaceutical company has standard materials that are about the efficacy of their drugs or, you know, questions like that. And they've already pre-selected certain journal articles and content that, you know, talk about those um, specific um, issues. And so if it's a New England Journal of Medicine article that's quoted in the standard response document, then they can provide that article out to the HCP without paying for um, a separate fee to this, through the CCC. So copyright compliance is important, but understanding all these license terms is a whole other learning curve for a lot of people. But you find that a lot of people don't want to do content procurement because they Information professionals may not like to negotiate. I actually love this role, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's something that you have to really like. Um, it, some people don't want to do it, um, but I think there's great opportunities for people to work in this space. And um, another part of that, of course, is building productive relationships. Sometimes the relationship you have with your procurement person in your company, um, I've had one of them say to me, I'll be your bad cop. You can be the good cop, so you maintain that relationship with that account manager and that supplier. So, you know, <laughs> that's one of the ways that you can maintain what I said here, building those productive relationships. Because you also want to know what's coming down the pike, what are the product enhancements. You have to deal with account manager changes all the time. What are the pricing models? And pricing model means, like, do they license only across the enterprise and your company maybe only needs 10 licenses because it's a small group, but the, the company says, well, we're only going to license it for the entire company. Well, that doesn't really work. And you have to know when you want to walk away and when you're not. Service model changes. Sometimes back, um, and you may know this in academia, there's what's called a concurrent user license where you could say up to five people could have used this database at the same time. Some companies just said, we're just changing our license model so you no longer can do concurrent, so it's enterprise or nothing. So there's a lot of those things you have to understand and be flexible with and be able to negotiate with those publishers or be able to walk away if your company decides they don't want to do it. Um, there's also managing projects to streamline the renewal process, um, knowing how to structure your agreements so that you're not renewing 120 contracts every year, because um, most pharma companies have similar content, and if you have a license for every public journal publisher plus all the databases, it can be over 100. So if you structure like 25% of them or more, one year, two year, or three year licenses, that way you're not doing them all at the same time every year, because it's a lot of work. And then I mentioned managing the budget and the forecast. So some companies have a monthly forecast where you have to go in and update in the finance systems. At my current company, we just do three a year. So again, a lot of it is understanding how to run the budget <laughs> and then also negotiating with the suppliers. So I'll move on to outreach and training, which for many companies has become more of a key role recently. So let's say you are spending, you know, $5 million on content. I think it's worth having a role to do this kind of job um, because you want to make sure that you are maximizing your return on investment in the products that you're licensing. So this training and awareness role or some groups, some companies call it marketing and training. It's a way to, you usually it's a manager level role um, and it's developing the strategy to de deliver the training. 
So I just want to make sure people do understand it doesn't mean you're always delivering the training, because if it's training on a database, many times we just have the vendor do it. We do training, of course, on our own internal processes and, you know, awareness of our services. But if it's a training on, you know, trial trove database, then we have the vendor do it. But it's understanding and setting a strategy every year and being able to say, what are we focusing on? What's the most important resources that we should be looking at? Maybe the most costly ones. How do we look at the usage and see who's in what department? And maybe only 5% of the people in this department are using it, and we expect that more people should be. So that way you could better target how to offer training or find out what the barriers are for that group. Um, benchmarking, of course, um, with internal and external training experts. Working with a learning and development function in your company, or if you don't have one, then looking at how do I deliver training in different ways. Sometimes people just want a two-minute WebEx to get started, you know, like a little recorded video. We, every company should have a YouTube channel to be able to click through and just listen, what's the basics to get me started on a database. Most people don't come to one-hour training anymore, unless, of course, you're feeding them, and then they'll show up. So then, then a lot of this is, is you have to do a lot of writing um, because you're usually promoting the resources through email or on your intranet and writing stories that get published through public affairs. So operations can work with the content manager quite a bit and work with the other people in the department. Um, this can be anything from managing the library website or sometimes companies have it in SharePoint partnering with IT or the hosting company as needed to update the site. Um, many companies have now moved to a ticketing system for requests because there's literature search requests, which the information scientists pick up. Then there is the regular tickets of, hey, I tried to access this article and I couldn't. Can you help me with that? So we do have an operations person who handles all of those kinds of tickets. And we are also trying to get people to start you know, utilizing the resources that we've set to put them into the workflow so it links them to the licensed journals. And if they're searching, for example, PubMed, which is a medical database from U.S. government, that way there's a little icon that says click to access Gilead. So if they start with our special link, it puts them in a workflow to take them to the licensed journal if we have it. But if we don't, it actually opens up an order form populates the citation data, and they can just click order to go to the document service. Um, so, you know, we, there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of communication and instructions that you're sending out to people a lot of times. Um, or sometimes people report, hey, I can't access this journal. Is it down? Then we either look at it of if it's ac accessible for us, is it an issue with their IP, IT, you know, their, if it's an IT issue, then we have to turn it over to IT because maybe they have a, an issue with their computer, you know, and access to the network. So there's a lot of those kinds of things that happen too. So another big part of that is, of course, gathering all the usage statistics uh, for the journals because you look at how many downloads have you had on the counter compliance statistics versus like if the license fee is this much and we could order it for less money ad hoc when it's needed, then we would cancel the subscription or what we call licensing the journal and then just have people order it instead. So that we look at that um, return on investment calculation every year. So my team member has a huge Excel spreadsheet. She is the Excel wizard. <laughs> and she says, okay, this is what we're paying for this journal title. This is how many downloads from the usage. This is like the calculation. Um, and we've actually got a very interesting metric in there because we always say, if you send it, if you send people to an ordering form instead of it being licensed, I actually calculate that um, it would be half the number of downloads because people never order as many articles as they click on. So we kind of divide it in half. So, so let's say there were a thousand downloads, but it's a $23,000 journal or something or more expensive. But if you said, okay, if we send it to order and then there's only half, would it be cheaper to order it ad hoc as needed? The other thing is, um, that's different in a lot of corporations. Once you've ordered, let's say you ordered the article because you didn't have a subscription, that goes into a repository because it's already, you've already paid the copyright and you can reuse it in your company as much as you want. So as part of our ordering workflow, if it's already in our system, 
it pulls it up for people so that it doesn't get ordered again and again. And, you know, even if you do that with your supplier, you can negotiate a lower rate for the reordering. So you're not having to pay like the $50 copyright fee, you just pay for the transaction fee to the supplier. Um, so there's a lot of things to manage around the, the journals and the database statistics too. Um, and I mentioned document delivery service, there's a lot of linking and authentication. When I worked at another company, they called it all the chewing gum and string that has to happen, all these integrated systems to make everything work. Um, like I said, the linking from the subscribe content through the workflows out to the ordering form, et cetera. And then, of course, you're working with um, different colleagues like the IT professionals to resolve these issues. So there are, of course, other opportunities in companies, as I touched on at the beginning of this section. Um, there's data scientist roles, which can be very different, um, more statistics-based, more looking at maybe huge data sets of real-world data and doing a lot of analysis on that. My team does get involved in text mining um, and data mining projects, There's, and I've got tools listed at the end that are commonly used in pharmaceutical companies, but we don't have the same role as, as defined as what, you know, a program would call a data scientist. So I mentioned enterprise content management. Again, this is managing more of the internal assets. Um, patent searching, again, most of the people who work in patent searching are usually chemists. They have like a PhD in chemistry, um, and then they get patent searching expertise and like a certification, and they work usually for the legal department. And I talked about CI. Um, also, the role that's interesting that one of my colleagues in the past had, had migrated to, like, you know, she changed jobs. A business analyst is somebody who takes all the requirements for a system and organizes them in a way to understand what everyone needs. I mean, if you think about a reference interview, you're basically helping to reiterate and understand what somebody needs before you do work for them. And that's what a business analyst does a lot of times is takes all that information in, organizes it, and works with, like, project manager to work with uh, on an IT project, for example. So there are some people who have moved into business analyst roles as well. Um, and then I mentioned project management. Um, there's a lot of technology initiatives, setting up integrated portals of content um, and integrating content programmatically, like through data feeds, like application programming interface kind of things or RSS feeds. Some new stuff is still done via RSS, but there's a lot of opportunities on project management as well. And a lot of times as people start moving up in the organization, they're no longer really doing literature searching, they're more managing projects and managing services. So that happens quite a lot um, in many companies. So how many of you have an, a STEM degree? Raise your hand. Science, technology, engineering, and math. A vote. Okay. So we'll talk about this. Like, is this a requirement? Do you have to be a biologist or a chemist or something like that? So this slide says yes and no, but my answer is yes, no, and maybe. So if you are an information scientist supporting, let's say, chemistry and biology, um, I would say yes, um, because there is, as people now have so access to so many information sources, there's, there's being able to be in that searcher role, but there's also an analysis piece of it that now happens, and you're working with colleagues who are in the patent department, in the biology department, in the bioinformatics group, et cetera, and you're working on a project team. So the expertise is usually very similar, and you're not just running a literature search in the medical literature literature and returning the results, it's a much different workflow and skill level that's required now. But there are still people who, you know, like in hospital libraries, et cetera, who may not have to have, be a pharmacist to be doing biomedical literature searching in a hospital. Um, again, data scientists analyzing statistical data, you may need to be a mathematician or a statistician. Or a bioinformatician is somebody who a lot of times has a biology degree and also a computer science degree. Now, these things, these roles are available in pharmaceutical companies, but in the library information services department, you can be an information scientist, but also you don't have to be a scientist, as in a STEM degree, if you're working in different roles. So I mentioned content management, the content procurement piece of it. Um, training and outreach, not a requirement. 
operations, STEM is not a requirement. And if you're an information scientist supporting like business development, the corporate strategy group, those kinds of roles don't necessarily have um, a degree in engineering, biology, chemistry, et cetera. So what I would say though is that of course, if you already have a biology degree, it's not going to hurt. <laughs> I think it's very helpful, um, you know, and you can speak equally with people when they're talking about targets, drug targets. <laughs> so I like to tell people about what's called the top model. So talent, organization, and passion. So when you're looking at where am I going to work and what's going to make me happy, what role is best for me, the top model is the integration of these three things. So your career best is actually when your talent, the organization that you're working in, and your passion all come together. And this is the best happy place for people who are in this role. And remember I talked at the beginning about, you know, finding, the, using those soft skills that a lot of people have. This is a great place um, to look at what other companies look at. So last year, there was an article in Bloomberg where they do a survey of what recruiters from big corporations, banks, et cetera, want from MBA graduates. And you could actually filter it by pharmaceutical industry. You could filter by different industries like finance or banking, et cetera. What I found fascinating about this, because I presented this out also at SLA uh, PhD conference last year. I was fascinated by this because a lot of times you think, oh, wouldn't they think the most important or hardest to find skills would be, I need people who do financial modeling. I need them to come out of school to understand, you know, um, you know, uh, laws and governance about, you know, working in finance or banking or things like that, or they need to be Excel wizards or whatever, you know, be an, a financial analyst. But actually what was so fascinating about this is that these are all soft skills. So people in who are recruiters said when they hired MBA graduates, which I, like I said, I know it says MBA, but I think this is so relevant for people who are coming into like any function, you know, whether it's a library science student or somebody who has like a liberal arts degree, et cetera. Um, communication skills were most important in the pharma. Like 73.9% of the recruiters said, we need people who have communication skills. Because, you know, there is always that kind of joke about people who are so technical that they can't talk to people. Um, luckily, I'm one of those extroverted librarians, so I never had that problem. But, you know, <laughs> communication skills, strategic thinking, you don't have to be a vice president of a function to be a strategic thinker. Um, leadership skills, same thing. You know, are you leading by example? Can you take everyone's input into consideration? Creative problem solving. I thought this was just fascinating, and there's more. So there were two more. Work experience, which was interesting because 54% of them said it was hardest to find, even though I think a lot of people who get their MBA work in consulting for like five years after their undergrad before they go get their MBA. So I thought, I thought that was kind of interesting that they didn't in pharma anyway they still needed people with pharmaceutical work experience or some kind of work experience, and they said it was hard to find. Um, and then, of course, working collaboratively. I think that's so key. Basically, every project that you work on now is all a team project. Accomplishments of the group are, of an individual are accomplishments for the team, and that's how you report out success as a leader. It's not, I did this, it's that the team did this. So working collaboratively is so critical because, like I said, every project you do, every person usually has a role in the group, you know, and whatever, even if it's a cross-functional team, like your people plus people from your accomplishments, that's what's also important as a leader. So the next slide I also have, um, I like to call it your superpower. <laughs> so how many of you know what your superpower is? That is like, we're going to talk about your strengths, and I like to call it the superpower. So raise your hand if you know your superpower. Did you lose the audio? Okay. Um, so we'll move on to the next one. I have done some external research. I won't call this benchmarking because there's no 
statistical data there. <laughs> oh, good, Kim, thank you. Um, the, um, what's, you know, important to people in pharmaceutical companies and uh, as far as roles and responsibilities, things like that. There's many different aspects here for people to sort of choose, you know, like strengthening market and, marketing and outreach, navigating organizational change, building a relationship, closer relationship with your clients. There's a lot of opportunities here for people to make contributions in their company. So where does that leave you? Where, does, I, where do you, how do you start doing this? And I included this visual because I wanted to say, you have to own your career. It's not a self-driving car. It's not going to happen by itself. Um, you have to actually drive it. And I think that, um, you know, you have to understand how do I make my life happen? I think it's all about personal motivation. I think it's all about understanding where you want to go. And that's where we'll get into also this, um, you know, superpower or your strengths. We could talk about that. So. Look at opportunities like connecting with information professionals. Are you even involved in SLA, Special Libraries Association, or other divisions, even specific divisions of SLA? How are you meeting more people? Are you seeking out opportunities for development? There's internships. There's scholarships for conferences. There's all kinds of mentoring programs. Um, we, in the pharmaceutical division, we have travel scholarships for the spring, what we call our spring meeting, which is actually going to be jointly located with SLA in June next year. We only had like uh, one person, or we had two people apply, and then he said, the one we picked, he said, oh, I can't come to the spring meeting, but then we deferred it, and he came to the summer regular SLA annual meeting, um, which was great, but actually that meant one award went without being awarded to anyone, you know, for like the summer meeting. So. A lot of people who are students could get these travel awards, like a scholarship to go to these conferences and your hotel and your airfare, et cetera, is paid for, and they're not taking advantage of applying for these. Um, are, you, are you seeking out, you know, changing your role? Like, are you building expertise by looking at other um, opportunities and thinking about a stretch goal? Um, another thing that I think people don't think about when they're fairly junior in their career um, because this is something that companies do want to know, and it's part of what's called your talent profile in your HR systems, is knowing your mobility. So what that means is, am I willing to move, like not just even for your own company, but, and you wouldn't, of course, put that in your talent profile, but am I willing to move? Would I want an assignment, for example, in my company outside the U.S.? Maybe a short-term assignment or a long-term assignment. I want to have an opportunity to work in, you know, the U.K. or the Netherlands. You know, speak to your manager about that. What are the opportunities that are available for you to take on another role? Look at other departments. Find um, opportunities to do like a rotation or a special project. Then that way you can start learning something new and that will help you decide, oh, that was a great opportunity, but it wasn't the right fit for me. But, you know, then you still can come back to your, you know, regular job and look for other ways um, to expand your roles. So. Have you looked at any of the vendors or what we call the suppliers working with corporate information centers? There's many different companies. They would be happy to provide, you know, probably overviews of their services or their tools. And again, highlighting those soft skills. Um, obviously very important for many companies to have employees. I mentioned a lot of these current needs, outreach training, marketing, metrics and visualization is still very important. If you don't know how to use Excel, you really have to learn, or if you already know how to use Tableau, you're ahead of everyone else. <laughs> so communication skills, can you talk to people, can you understand, you know, how to communicate out your idea, how to present to executive leadership, how to be short and sweet and get your point across. There's a lot around communication that people still um, have an opportunity to learn. And I mentioned leadership and collaboration already. The most important thing, I think, is actually agility. So. In your current role, are you flexible if your boss says to you, like, I really would like you to take on this, you know, project and manage it? Do you say yes or do you say, mm, I'm not sure if I'm ready? You know, get the help that you need. Don't take on something that you think is completely beyond your capacity, but at the same time, 
being a very flexible, agile employee will bring you future opportunities in your organization. Because companies change their organizational structures all the time in corporations. And you have to be ready. And somebody who can move very fluidly around the organization is going to be retained for a much longer period of time than someone who says, I don't want to learn that. So how do you build your knowledge? You know, what do you need to learn about? Um, there's a lot of places, you know, that you can learn these things. Tableau, there's lots of free, you know, learning available on, you know, webinars and through their website. There's analysis and visualization. Pipeline pilots use quite a lot in corporations. Spotfire for visualization. Um, Stanford actually has a continuing education session for data scientists. It's not a degree program, but it would give you an introduction. Um, there's text and data mining I've mentioned. Linguomatics I2E is a tool that's used in a lot of pharmaceutical companies for text mining. Some companies are getting involved with IBM Watson to look at how to filter, you know, terabytes of data, you know, to make, to find the information. Um, Cybite termite is another one if you're looking at taxonomy management or ontologies in your company or tax mining. And then Bizant is a very small company that's been around a long time, but they can actually take multiple data sets and combine it so it helps you harmonize and be able to present information in a different way. And I mentioned ontology management a bit as well. So I mentioned, uh, I'll talk about additional resources. I already did mention, you know, SLA and these career and travel awards that a lot of people don't take advantage of them. So I put a link in here to be able to, you know, find out what awards are in your, in your chapter or in your specific division that you're interested in. But you don't have to be a member of that chapter or division. I, it might have to be a chapter member, but not, maybe not that division to be able to click through and apply for an award. But you should definitely take a look at that to see, you know, what's available. Because if you can get a free travel award, to go to an SLA conference to cover your hotel and your airfare, et cetera, you know, what an opportunity to network with so many people and learn. Um, and um, there's a Nature Reviews Drug Discovery article that was written by um, the Pharma Documentation Ring members in 2012, and it's about what key roles and responsibilities and functions there are in, in most corporate information centers. And as I mentioned, the Pharma Documentation Ring is this organization of like 25 member pharmaceutical companies, their information groups. So I'm involved in that along with many others. So Merck and Pfizer and Novo Nordisk and Novartis and, you know, they have a public website. You can find out about the PDR. It's p-d-r.com. Um, I talked about knowing your superpower. Do you know what your strengths are? Um, there's a book called um, the Clifton Strengths Finder. There's a uh, a book or you can do an online assessment, but it's really an interesting exercise. And actually the San Francisco chapter had a strengths finder session that as a student you only had to pay like $25 to go. Um, and they filled up pretty quickly, but look for these kinds of opportunities and you could do that assessment at a much lower cost and also get the facilitated session that went along with that. So you did the assessment first and then went to this class that was uh, in the evening or something. So that helps you sort of figure out, like, well, what are my strengths and how, what would be a good place for me to, to go? So I mentioned uh, also additional, like, different databases I talked about. Of course, biomedical literature. I, um, PubMed is a, the National Library of Medicine one. But there are Ovid and ProQuest Dialog, which is how com pharma companies integrate different data sources like Medline from the National Library of Medicine along with other different databases. So there, I'll just, you know, leave this slide up here to, you know, have you take a look at this. But many of these companies I'm sure would be happy to, you know, do demonstrations or show you more about it. Um, they're always really helpful and, you know, their websites are easily Googleable. That's word. <laughs> and then in, I just would like to say thank you. Um, a lifetime of happiness lies ahead of you. This is actually was a, a fortune that my husband got when we were out to dinner and like the week before he was going to ask me to marry him. So I thought it was a good picture to put up, but it was a different sort of outcome than a job, but a lifetime of happiness can be ahead of you. Thank you 
for that presentation. I have about 600 questions that I've been um, noting, but I think we want to um, open this up to Mayong. Would you like to ask a question or ask some questions or type in some questions? And Kelly, what do we need to do to make sure that Mayong May May um, can be heard or, or communicate? It looks like they're going to be typing, so. Um, okay. Hopefully, hopefully they can still hear us. <laughs> yep, I know how that goes. <laughs> okay, been there, done that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Question, great, go ahead. Great question. Yep. yep. That is an excellent question. And um, the answer to that is we did have an intern this summer. Um, we posted it through San Jose State, but they wouldn't post it on the internship list. Not that I'm talking about the <laughs> school in any certain way, Kim, or anything. But I guess it has to be for credit, I think, if it's posted on the internship opportunities, right? Is that what they told me? But ours was not for credit, but we actually ended up hiring someone who lived in Arizona. And let me just tell you, some of these internships pay like $30 an hour. So oh, it was a missed yeah. opportunity for someone to not have uh, – <laughs> applied. So I only received, I, I worked with San Jose State, I only got one resume from San Jose State. That was it. <laughs> oh one my student. gosh, okay. So let me check with Mayong. Um, Which by the way, let me just say, this is one of the reasons I'm working on a resume review session with two other SLA people because the resume I did receive was not very good. It was very poor. And um, I would love the opportunity and we're working on a session that's a live session that people could hear what's expected and then actually have somebody do their, their um, do like get tips on their resume at a, at a live session. And no, I cannot hear her. She said her audio was gone, but she could type, I think. Okay. So we're we're thinking that there may be poor connectivity. So um, okay. While but, well, hold on, Kim. Let me just also tell you. I po I, post, oh. I posted it through San Jose. I posted it on LinkedIn. It was on the Gilead website. Uh, I posted it many times through SLA um, and many different SLA Connect mm -hmm. sessions. So I tried to brought, like spam it out to everybody as much as possible. <laughs> That is amazing because, to your point, that would be an incredibly valuable internship. Not just financially, which is amazing and wonderful, um, but experience and contacts and sort of learning the environment, you, it would be phenomenal. Is, and yeah. Does Gilead do internships on a regular basis? Yeah, they, it's every summer. It's a huge program. And um, they have a whole separate part of the website where you can select the internship positions. It was across many, many different departments. Um, so, so we did post ours through. Um, and it usually, I think we had to have everything posted out around March. Um, but I'm trying to remember if I did budget for someone next year. I think I did because it was a great opportunity. I would say our first time doing it, I probably didn't do a good enough job like with the team of saying, here's like a really cool exciting role and you could come in and do this fabulous thing, but, you know, we had a lot of different tasks, but we still need to, I think, design a better big project for the student, but we will definitely have that for next year. It was our first time, but she had a great time. She was really fun. She was older, and like I said, she came from Arizona and lived here in the summer while she worked here. Oh my gosh, how fabulous. Okay, so all three of us want to do that with you next summer. <laughs> I have a great team, and she just integrated really well, and she was a fabulous fit. Okay. Well, that that's great to know. Um, Mayung, how about any other questions from you? Because it sounds like you have a background in sort of the STEM field. Are there other questions that you would ask, want to ask Mindy? And I'm going to sort of volunteer this question myself. 
could Mayong um, follow up with you, Mindy, if if she's sort of combining parenting and and participating? Would you feel okay about having Mayong um, follow up with you after the the webcast? Absolutely. I'm on LinkedIn. Anybody can reach me through there, um, cool. and I do respond, you know, to messages from people. So I'd be happy to. Okay. Well. You know, I have, uh, I'm looking at my list, I have like 12 questions here, and so... Oh, she did have one. Mm -hmm. uh, my so what would a fresh graduate do or should do? Okay. That was the general direction. Okay. I would say get involved. I know it's a big time commitment, but even just integrate, going to like a networking event through SLA or, you know, finding people through LinkedIn. I. I've actually just also had lunch and, and or coffee with people who've been interested in learning more, and they've come to the site to meet with me um, just to understand more about the roles that are available. And I know my team would be interested in doing that as well. So I think networking with people, looking through the SLA directory, reaching out, be just being very proactive and saying, hey, I have, if I could meet with you for 30 minutes, you know, at your site or however much time you want to propose, but don't tell them you want two hours, you know, buy you a <laughs> cup of coffee or buy you lunch, you know, or whatever, you know, I would love to meet with you and sort of ask you, you know, these questions and give people a heads up on what those are. And I think you would find most information professionals are very willing to do that. Um, so I'm typing in just in case Mayon can't hear us. Where are you located? Okay, in San Jose. So you guys are close by. Oh. Then. Yeah, I think yeah, I think this could be a great opportunity. Very mm -hmm. very cool. Yeah, well, definitely. We are at 6.30 Pacific time, and so I'm going to wrap this up by saying, Mindy, this has just been an amazing presentation, and I think all three of us are, are walking away with about 500 different things to think about or look at or research um, and follow up with you about. So I can't thank you enough on behalf of the San Jose students and um, iSchool for you taking the time to do this because this has been, from someone who's a career uh, advisor, this has been one of the best overviews I've ever seen. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening, and all three of us will look forward to staying in touch. With that, I'll wrap up. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. And if anybody does want to contact me through LinkedIn, you know, feel free to do so. Um, you know, I'm definitely open to talking to people about, you know, what their career options could be. Wonderful. We